Welcome to the Aspen Institute's Hearst Lecture Series event on the future of higher education, how research universities are responding to COVID-19. I'm Crystal Logan, the Aspen Institute's Vice President for Aspen Community Programs and Engagement. And I wanna first thank Bob and Soledad Hearst for making this series possible. Thanks to our panelists for joining today. And finally, thanks to our audience for tuning in for this important conversation. There are links to the panelists' bios in the chat feature on your screen. Please monitor the chat for important uh, information throughout the event. And if you have a question for any of the panelists, please type those into the Q&A feature during the event. We're thrilled and honored to feature this panel of leaders today. Dr. Julio Frank is the president of the University of Miami, and he also served as the Minister of Health for Mexico for six years. Dr. Christina Johnson, Chancellor of the State University of New York, also served as US Undersecretary of Energy. Janet Napolitano, is the president of the University of California and served as the US Secretary of Homeland Security and as governor of Arizona. And our moderator today is Dr. Dan Porterfield, president and CEO of the Aspen Institute. He comes to us from leadership positions in higher education at Franklin and Marshall College and Georgetown University. Everyone on this panel is a giant in their field and we look forward to learning from them. Over to you, Dan, thank you. Thank you, Crystal. Uh, and thank you, uh, Julio, uh, Janet, and Christina for being here today and to all of our attendees uh, and to the Hearst family, which supports this uh, spectacular lecture series. Um, if we just counted the number of alums of your three institutions, I think we get above 3 million. Um, if we just, counted the number of faculty at your institutions, I think we might get close to 400,000, maybe more. Um, if we counted the discoveries that the researchers have made at your institutions and their impact upon humanity, it would probably touch every person on the planet. Uh, these are three of the most important institutions uh, in our country. And we have three leaders that are uh, extraordinary for their ability um, to focus on uh, leading institutions that are complex, highly impactful, uh, messy at times, and absolutely essential to the public good. And so uh, let's jump right in uh, with the, um, the questions I'll ask will be about um, uh, medical centers at this moment and public health programs, research and why it matters at this time, how you're thinking about uh, the opening of your campuses, and the pivot that you've made to virtual learning, um, what it's like to lead a people-serving institution of this size and scope in a time of, of such great complexity and human need. Um, and first, if I may, um, the whole country has been rocked since the killing of George Floyd with the awareness that structural and interpersonal racism exists in so many different ways in our society and in our communities in our workplaces, uh, uh, in our families. And we've all as a country been having a reckoning about what more can we do to lean into and live the ideals of our country. Each of you are leaders in this work. And I might ask if you would just comment briefly about um, this moment of reckoning in your academic communities and what you're learning as you listen to people. Um, I'm not sure how to call on you, so I'm just gonna take the moderator's prerogative of just picking you, uh, and I'll just return. I'll just rotate. So perhaps we could start uh, with Chancellor Johnson. Thank you very much, Dan, and, and it's a, a pleasure and honor to be on this panel with President Napolitano, and of course with, with President of Frank. Uh, the very difficult time, the brutal killing of George Floyd really laid bare the deep seated cultural inequalities in this country. And um, higher education is um, 
no stranger to that either. And I, I think that um, we think about our constitution and the Bill of Rights, the force of law is still maliciously and disproportionately applied to people who are black, brown, LGBTQ. And, you know, this injustice is intolerable. So, um, and it compounds the anguish of the COVID-19 pandemic. So we need to root out the racism and that's on us. Um, when I think about some of the things that we're trying to do within SUNY, um, there's still a lot more to do. One of the first things that I noticed when I became chancellor three years ago was that although the demographics of our students were between 25 and, and 30% underrepresented minority, our professoriate was only 9%. So my view is if, if you see it, you can be it. But if you can't see it in the classroom, if the people that are teaching our next generation don't look like them, then I think we failed. So we put in place a program called Prodigy, which is promoting the recruitment, retention, opportunities for inclusive growth with the goal of hiring a thousand underrepresented minority faculty and women in STEM over the next decade. So we started that, this is our second year. And with the goal that we can diversify the professoria, but that's just the beginning. We still need to, to diversify our staff, our academic leadership. So um, this is gonna take time. It's gonna take every single one of us. And I think that that's the moment that we all realize, yes, there is racism. It needs to be rooted out. I think we've known that before, but we need to act and we need to do it now. Yep. Thank you, Chancellor Johnson. Uh, President Frank, how are you thinking about this today? You know, I, I always think of universities as boundary spanning institutions. We, we, we are a community. Of course, we're, as a private university, we're much smaller than either of the systems that President Napolitano and Chancellor Johnson represent, but it is a community of students, faculty, staff. On the other hand, we are outward facing. We provide a vital service to uh, both by education, research, and healthcare, mostly in, as, as our main form of service to communities. And in this particular case, if you look at, the, at, at what we provide to the larger society, first of all, universities have a crucial role in illuminating the causes of structural racism, the persistence of, of, uh, of those practices linked um, to, to abuses of power by uh, law enforcement. Uh, those are topics that are in, intrinsically complex and one of our fundamental duties is through scholarship and research to illuminate that conversation, that societal conversation and provide that guidance at this time. But at the same time, we need internally to serve as a model in our own internal community for the larger society. I like to think of universities as exemplary institutions. It's a very old idea. Universities as providing an example to the larger society of which they're part in the values they espouse and the, and the behaviors they exhibit. And therefore, as Chancellor Johnson was saying, we, we are also embarking in, in, we have embarked in very specific goals of uh, not just embracing diversity, but also very specifically in our case in Miami, the big challenge is our black faculty and black students. Uh, we, you know, Hispanics are not a, uh, an issue. I myself as president, <laughs> identify as such, um, a, but, but being very focused uh, around creating a, a not just diversity by numbers, but really developing a culture of belonging where everyone feels value and everyone has the opportunity to add value in our internal community. And, and that is another very important aspect of what we do, serve as that model or example to the larger society of which we are. Uh, thank you, President Frank. Uh, President Napolitano? Well, I think we have to begin by not letting ourselves forget that eight minutes and 46 seconds that we saw on video. So um, powerful and uh, such a demonstration of uh, uh, not only um, uh, a murder being committed before our very eyes, but a murder being committed by someone who uh, was privileged to wear a badge and carry a gun uh, and, um, you know, raising issues about um, structural racism 
in, in many, many elements of our society. And as universities, we have a key responsibility here. Um, uh, uh, we have the responsibility for uh, um, doing uh, the research and helping to illuminate as uh, President Frank just said, uh, the causes and the historical context and uh, uh, the social implications of uh, the structural racism that we're experiencing. Uh, we, we have to reform ourselves with uh, intentionality and persistence and consistency. Uh, and that means our student bodies, uh, but also importantly, our professoriate as uh, President Johnson uh, uh, said they're doing it. SUNY, uh, we ourselves are, are doing at uh, the University of California. Uh, we need to uh, serve as uh, examples uh, that can uh, uh, be um, replicated. Um, uh, for example, we um, have our own police departments. We need to make sure that uh, our police departments are 21st century police departments and that uh, uh, they are uh, built upon uh, having a culture of safety and partnership uh, and not an us versus them uh, uh, dynamic. And so uh, um, we're going back in. We, we had a task force on policing just a year ago. Uh, we're going back in uh, to see what more it is we should do with respect to our own uh, uh, policing uh, 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 activities. Uh, you know, there's so much that uh, we sh should as a country do in this area, and we should not let it go by uh, without endeavoring uh, to accomplish major reform. Uh, let's not let this be a, an episode, but let it be an inflection point. Well, you know, each of you is, uh, uh, is striving to create that exemplary community that President Frank spoke of, and there's so much to it when you're running an institution of the size and complexity of, your, of yours. Um, let's make a pivot now to one part of these, the mission, which is to have an academic health center or a medical center where you're providing on the ground immediate uh, responses to urgent needs in this era of COVID-19. I'd like to get to the research in a moment, but let me just ask, what is it like to be responsible for medical institutions during the middle of this pandemic? Um, maybe, maybe Julio, i go to you first. Sure. Um, well, I've been living this because when we were bracing for the uh, surge in demand that we were expecting, and as we were, of course, Florida came later uh, after California and after New York, uh, and, and we very much wanted to avoid any situation of our academic health system becoming overwhelmed. We, we are the sole academic health system in South Florida. But we provide that cutting edge, most specialized care, which is absolutely critical in, in a complex disease like COVID-19. So the board actually asked me to um, step in as interim CEO of, of our academic health system. So for these three months, I have been yeah. performing the dual role of being president of the entire university, but also being the CEO of the academic health system, because uh, you know that happens to be my professional training is as a physician and then someone who specialized in global public health. I, this is the fifth pandemic I have had, I wouldn't call it the privilege, but the experience of uh, being in a decision-making position. So I, I've been looking at that very closely at the operational level and um, and we were very mindful of the need to get ahead of the game. I mean, this is, you know, by definition, every time there's a, a new pathogen, what defines the emergency is uncertainty. We, this is the first time humans are interacting with this particular virus. So we are learning as we go. And, and that requires a mindset in which you are contemplating every possible scenario, including the worst case scenario, and getting ready for those. It's not preparing for the best and, and hoping for the worst and hoping for the best. It's, prepare, it's, it's preparing for the worst and working for the best. And, and that's what we did. We, we got ahead in terms of procurement, of making sure we expanded intensive care, uh, procurement of ventilators, all of that. 
and, and, and then being ready there as the um, pinnacle of the medical referral system for the most acute and complicated cases. And so far we've, we've been able to, to do so without being overwhelmed, but it's not over. And we continue to be on that process of, of always trying to stay one step ahead of the pandemic. Yeah, and how how is the uh, Julio? How's the morale of your of all of your colleagues working on the front lines? It, it's good. Uh, I think uh, because we we were very mindful about the need to provide personal protective equipment and send a very clear signal that you know the safety of our front our frontline health providers is absolute priority. Uh, we we haven't had many uh, incidents there. Uh, and, and the morale is good. I think this is where the best of our, of the way we educate doctors, nurses, and other health professionals in, in an ethic of service, it, this is where it comes to, to, to the forefront. Yeah. So the morale is good. Yeah. Um, Christina, uh, what is it, has it been like to do this in the context of uh, New York State, which was one of the places where it hit earliest and hardest? Well, um... I was uh, amazed, uh, Dr. Frank, I didn't know your background. I think that's awesome that you stepped in as also interim CEO. I can't imagine that and running the university. So hats off to you. You know, I think one of the interesting things about the State University of New York is so we have five medical centers and we have three hospital systems and they're geographically spread out. So that really helped us because we have a, a medical center, excellent one up in Buffalo, then in Syracuse, and then we have three that are actually in the, we're in the epicenter. So those would be the located uh, in Brooklyn and Manhattan. So New York City, obviously, and then Long Island. So that really helped us because um, as we we're starting to see the surge in Long Island and New York City, the other medical se uh, systems helped out. So they helped out because we worked together to collaborate around research and research and antivirals and, and vaccines. We look to provide um, personnel and PPE. I think one of the most moving things that I've seen, and you may have seen it on national TV, was when um, it really hit Stony Brook University Hospital and uh, also Downstate Health Sciences University Hospital. So just to give you a level set, UHB University Hospital, Brooklyn, about 83% Medicaid and Medicare. So they really are caring for, for the most needy in, in, um, in their communities. And they're just slammed. I mean, it really hit hard. And so they didn't have the nursing uh, staff. They didn't have the respiratory techs, the pharmacy techs. So the uh, Upstate Medical University provided um, somewhere about 50 personnel that volunteered to leave the safety of their homes and travel down, downstate, as we call it, and uh, to help out um, with Stony Brook and also downstate. So couldn't be more proud of those individuals that helped. Um, it also, some of the other campuses, even though they weren't medical centers because they had um, football fields, we actually built a temporary medical facility at Old Westbury College and another one at Stony Brook University. So it was interesting to see from a system perspective and I'm sure President Napolitano feels the same way how a system responds to something of this size, scale, and scope. So we had the facilities. Actually, the State University of New York, SUNY owns and operates 40% of the state buildings. So we had enormous physical stock. We, we actually had 80,000 students leave dorms and that freed up dorms in uh, Manhattan at the Fashion Institute of Technology. They, they freed up a dorm to house first responders and people that were building some of these temporary medical centers. So it was all the pieces that kind of worked together between the research and the facilities, the innovative products and processes and PPE, even um, Fashion Institute Technology and alumna started a company, um, a not-for-profit of course, called Sewing for Lives. And altogether, uh, they produced about 55,000 55, facial shields and facial coverings. So uh, I couldn't been more proud of the 90,000 employees and the 30,000 faculty that really pulled together to uh, help in this fight. Well, and it, it, there's been such leadership in New York in sustaining, yes. sustaining the improvements. I, yeah. I, I, I hope yeah. that you can't take it for granted, but I hope it gives you a feeling of pride to be a part of it. And what was it, what has it been like to work with Governor Cuomo, who's, who's had quite a lot of national visibility for his hands-on approach? You know, what a leader. 
thoughtful, caring, uh, appropriately aggressive, and a very terrific communicator. I mean, we're we're all a little bit in, in uh, withdrawal, I would say, because we look forward to the to the daily briefings because it was just someone that had such a gift to be able to communicate in a very calm, caring, thoughtful manner what needed to be done. And so we worked very closely with the governor's office, Governor Cuomo, Department of Health, because in the process, and I'm sure you know President Frank and President Paltano are, went through the same procedure, but we formed a, a task force in, working, in seven working groups and each campus then reflected that. And we've developed 64 plans for the different colleges that are geographically dispersed throughout the state. So they have a different risk profile in order to get ready for what we'll do uh, come fall of 2020. Yeah. Couldn't have done that without the leadership of, of uh, Governor Cuomo. Yeah, yeah, extraordinary. Um, so Janet, you've had lots of experience as a governor, as a head of Homeland Security, <laughs> uh, and uh, as uh, the president of, uh, of this enormous education system. Let's start with what, uh, what the Cal system has done. Uh, what's it been like sitting in your seat with uh, medical centers all across the state trying to save lives. Right, so we have medical centers from San Diego to Davis. Um, they quickly converted to being, uh, uh, to be, being COVID-19 hospitals essentially um, uh, and have been providing uh, um, that care. We, we like, um, uh, um, both President Frank and President Johnson uh, have a, a large percentage of Medi-Cal patients who uh, are in our hospital system. So uh, uh, providing care for them has been a, a privilege. Uh, we've been uh, coordinating with the state um, uh, with respect to overall state public health guidance. Um, and uh, you know, when you when you ask President Frank about morale, I, I would say that one of the great uh, things it's been for me to observe is how the uh, the physicians and nurses and respiratory therapists, but uh, also the the folks who provide food service and custodial service um, uh, at our hospitals, all really uh, leaned forward um, in into this. Um, uh, need to provide uh, care uh, for the uh, pandemic. And uh, beyond California, um, uh, UCSF sent uh, a large team to Queens in New York uh, uh, to Thank help you. there. And also uh, to the Navajo Nation, which was also uh, uh, sorely um, afflicted um, uh, by, the, by the virus. Uh, you know, now California is surging again. Um, our caseloads are approaching really what they were in March. Um, I think uh, the governor is going to be reluctant to have another statewide shutdown order, but uh, I believe he's going to have to slow down uh, the process of uh, reopening. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, we are uh, prepared. Uh, uh, again, to be COVID-19 hospitals. Uh, that, that's what we need to do. Yep. You know, one thing I would, from a management standpoint, I would have to mention is uh, uh, by turning ourselves into COVID-19 hospitals, um, we actually uh, lost a lot of money. Um, uh, in fact, the revenue loss uh, uh, to the University of California through the end of May from our hospitals, around $800 million, not a small sum. Uh, because of uh, the need to uh, uh, postpone or cancel other procedures that would otherwise be done in, in our hospitals. And so uh, when we think about federal funding uh, and federal support, uh, one of the things uh, we need particular attention paid for is uh, to help with these academic medical centers uh, uh, because they really did uh, take a, a leadership role in providing care here. Yeah, yeah. yeah thank you. Absolutely. Me. Exactly, and we've seen that across the country. Um, Janet, one quick follow-up. Um, you were uh, Homeland Secretary during H1N1, and right. you have dealt with uh, pandemics and crises of many types. And looking ahead, what would you want for our federal government's role for the next one of these? 
that we get. Is there a I, go ahead. I'd, I'd want the federal government to be quicker to the ball. Uh, I'd want them uh, to uh, uh, be better organized. I'd want them to uh, communicate uh, clearly and consistently with uh, information that uh, the people of the country need in order to empower themselves. Uh, they need to have information to know how, how best to protect themselves, how best to protect their communities. Uh, uh, we need the federal government to help with some of the procurement issues for uh, the basic necessities of providing care. Uh, I, I, I'm not shy in saying that I think the federal uh, government, uh, this administration was slow to the ball and uh, is still not providing uh, kind of the adequate overall framework and structure for things like testing uh, that you really need to have for effective pandemic response. Yep. I think one of the things on everybody's mind is that as the virus uh, gains strength in some parts of the country and the world, it imperils all parts of the country and all parts of the world. Right. Um, uh, we really are in a global struggle here. Right. And one of the tools in our arsenal is research. Um, the, and each of your institutions is a jewel in yeah. uh, employing faculty uh, and researchers who are working on basic science research or on the cutting edge of applied research in all ways, in all fields. And I think that's less understood maybe in the country than the teaching mission of our great universities. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess I would ask maybe each of you to comment about some something about the research mission of your institution that you feel is highly relevant to the, the circumstances that we're in today. Something that you're proud of and advocating for so that we can build more support for re the research function of our great institutions. I'll, I'll go to Chancellor Johnson first. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, I think several things that SUNY has in, in our area leading, and that's uh, both at University of Buffalo and also at University of Albany. So in partnership with Northwell Health, with University of Albany, and then University of Buffalo, both of them have established institutes for healthcare disparities. And so one of the things that they're looking at and, and studying is how, you know, this is for individuals, underserved communities that already have more comorbidities than maybe the average population. This is hitting particularly hard. So I think that they're uni in a unique position to study and figure out how do we better address it. So that's one area I'm very proud of. I think the other area that came together is um, at Upstate Medical University, we have some researchers that were working on you know, batch testing or pool testing. So you can make things one at a time, you can test people one at a time. Or if you have the right test, you could actually pool the, uh, call it saliva, if you will, from say 20 or 25 people in order to do what's called a find the needle in the haystack. So if you think about bringing back 400,000 students in the fall and you wanna be able to screen test, trace, and treat 1%, a tenth of a percent of the population that may be infected. So it's really important that you have zero false negatives because you have to find them, but you also don't want to have false positives because then that inundates the system. So that's another area where um, Upstate Medical University and some of our research researchers have taken a lead and they actually have within F, uh, at the FDA a uh, emergency use authorization for a particular test that is very good at doing this sort of pool or desk, uh, batch testing. It's that ability, you know, and I think this is something that I'm sure that President Napolitano, I know you're passionate about, and I'm sure you are too, President Frank, which is the ability, since we're a nonprofit, to bring people together, focused on a common problem that's important to society, and solve it. And so that sort of convergent research, I think, is really done well at the research institutions. It may be the one place where, you know, you're able to galvanize a system, including private and public partnerships to go after a problem that's very, very important. So I think that's the one thing I'd be, I would say we're, we're all very good at and should be proud of. Yeah, thank you. Uh, President Frank, your thoughts on this, on the research mission? 
I mean, I have no doubt that um, it's research that's going to get us to the other side of this pandemic. Uh, it, it is the key. And, you know, one interesting side effect is at a time when we were listening to uh, politicians all over the world, I mean, with this rise of, uh, of populism around the world, uh, question the value of experts, we find ourselves in a, in a moment when society is clamoring for the, for the opinion of experts. I mean, it, it, there's so much uncertainty because that defines every time there's a new pathogen that, they, that, that part of the anxiety that uncertainty produces to, uh, allows us to turn to experts. And that's what we concentrate in universities. So I, I think this is a moment where, where we need to rise and, and shine and in, in, in the literal sense of illuminating the path forward. And we do that obviously in the, in the life sciences research. We have groups at our medical school involved in, in new testing protocols um, and, and in vaccine development, as well as some of the clinical trials. Uh, we are actually one of the sites for uh, also the uh, phase one clinical trials for one of the RNA uh, uh, vaccines that are being tried out. So we're, we're very proud of that role we play. <clears throat> but in addition, to, and by the way, some of those are platforms that were developed for other problems. Uh, some of the testing groups, these are people who had been working on testing and, and, and drug development around other viral diseases like HIV AIDS. And although this is a very different virus, of course, but you can use those platforms of knowledge and purpose them for the particular pathogen at hand. And that's, that's why one of the lessons here is you need to keep that capacity, that platform capacity, mm -hmm. yeah. because there will be other, uh, other pandemics. We just don't know what is going to be the specific uh, pathogen at that point. And, and, and you need to be able to, to actually mobilize that. That is why there's, progress on the, on the vaccine development front in particular has been so fast, unprecedentedly fast. It's because we, we had those platforms, but we need to keep those. But beyond that, on the public health front, you know, universities are providing most of the epidemiological modeling. That's my professional community. I know them. Yeah. And yeah, a lot right. of the projections that you see at the White House, everyone using, are coming from universities. In Miami, we are providing uh, for the county all the uh, seroepidemiological surveys that's allowing to, to do that surveillance to identify hotspots and to measure what's the prevalence of the disease. Yeah. And then yeah. lastly, we shouldn't forget the social, uh, science, uh, the, so, so the social sciences here, particularly when we deal with the economic consequences of the pandemic, which is another crisis. And that <clears throat> includes you know, formulating uh, evidence-based policy to deal with the with mitigation measures uh, in terms of stimulus and, and, and compensation for, for families, et cetera. And then another thing that uh, Chancellor Johnson mentioned, our research on, on health uh, disparities, because that is playing out in a magnified way with the pandemic. And by the way, it's not unrelated to your first question, to the structural causes of racism, it gets expressed in the distribution of, uh, of, of illness and deaths, which disproportionately is affecting uh, uh, people of color, communities of color. So yeah. it's a comprehensive approach to problems that gives universities an incredible edge to help uh, navigate and, and, and come now up. These, these, these concepts are so important, a convergent research platform capacity epidemiological modelings, you know, uh, social science implications, so powerful and important. And yet, most in higher education struggle to build public awareness and sometimes yeah. you know, the, the sort of support of the funding community for this core work. And President Napolitano, you've worked on this for years. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think we need to do to build support for the research mission of our great institutions? Well, you know, um, these great research universities are foundational to so many things in, in, in our country. If, you know, the United States is to continue to lead the world and uh, in, in innovation, that innovation starts somewhere. And, and generally it starts in a university laboratory yeah. uh, and uh, in, in so many different areas. And 
Uh, during the, the pandemic, it's been uh, great to see the convergence of research on all issues involving the virus, uh, from uh, modeling to testing modalities, to uh, development of new therapeutics, to the basic science needed to uh, have a vaccine. Uh, uh, and some of it was done from, from schools outside of our, our medical research establishments. The College of Engineering uh, at Berkeley, for example, uh, figured out how to re-engineer the machines people use when they have sleep apnea uh, to be ventilators um, and, and to help with the, the ventilator shortage. So uh, uh, there's just so much work there that has a real world impact. And uh, if there's anything that I would uh, uh, emphasize by, by way of, of getting the public to appreciate it is to appreciate the real world impact of uh, the research done uh, at, our, at our universities. Um, you know, now there's a new bill. It was just uh, introduced yesterday in the, in the U.S. House of Representatives. It's called the RISE Act. Uh, uh, it would provide $26 billion to uh, support uh, uh, the, the research at our universities and uh, the ramp up of uh, non-COVID-19 research that had to be set aside for purposes of really focusing on the pandemic. And so uh, that, that bill would be a clear demonstration of uh, at least congressional appreciation of the research mm -hmm. uh, uh, function and the criticality of the research functioning uh, functionality at, at our universities. Dan, so can I, I wanna... follow up on something? Just oh, that, please do, uh, yes. If you yeah. don't mind, it's something that both President Frank and President Napolitano said. So I'll start with uh, what President Napolitano said with regard to the bills. I also think the leader, uh, Senator Chuck Schumer, introduced the endless frontier with regard to establishing right. not National Science and Technology Foundation. So again, a uh, large investment in research that would greatly impact in a very positive way the university. And the thing that I loved about uh, what you both said is this, and, and Dan, you commented on it too, it's this platform capacity. So in my field, when I was an engineer a long time ago, it was, I was the last class to take power electronics. You know, motors, generators, you know, it just was kind of, it was, analog, it was going out, digital was the hot thing, VLSI. So what's one of the hottest things right now in electrical engineering? It's power electronics for electric vehicles or renewable energy. So what's nice is that the researchers continued to work and then they integrated their knowledge into other courses to complement it so we never lost it. That was that capacity that we have. Maybe it was a little dormant, but the universities, because I think President Sexton said this out of the roughly 80 or 90 institutions in the world that are over the, over, older than 1,000 years, 77 are universities. And it's because of that continuum, that knowledge, that continue to push and preserve knowledge for the next generations because we don't know when we're going to need it. And I think that's something that the public also would be great to, for us to be communicating as well. Well, one of the things that, I, that I'd love for us to be able to talk about uh, is the undergraduate mission of your institutions and all of the different needs that today's students are facing. Um, and uh, rather than ask you a direct question about that, because I'd like to get to questions, um, what I'd like to do is offer a teaser and then go to questions. And the teaser is, could you say in one sentence, <laughs> what, what one major change you think we will see in undergraduate education a decade from now, perhaps hastened because of this, this this interlocked set of crises, or perhaps one that was on the way anyway. But if you think about the future of American education, one likely change. Um, a sentence on that, and then we'll open it up to our to our uh, our audience. Uh, President Napolitano, can I call on you first? Hey. Uh, <laughs> great. Greater integration of online learning into the residential college experience. Yeah. Okay. Uh, President Frank? Uh, we're, we're going to move to a more widely distributed educational experience along the entire career path of people rather than the front loading 
model we have now, where we front load education and graduate people, we will have a, a higher distribution where universities adopt an open architecture and are the prov providers of evolving educational services to meet the evolving educational needs of people throughout their entire career. Beautiful. Chancellor Johnson? I could listen to both of you all yeah. day. So the, the joy of going last is I'm going to combine what you both said. I think we're going to see the, the hybrid just-in-time learning online that President Paul Tano talked and the lifelong learning that is what I interpreted President Frank talking about. So I think that that, that just-in-time learning that will be enabled by online uh, education, remote instruction will be a continuum uh, all through one's life. Thank you so much. Let's uh, let's bring Crystal out. And Crystal, uh, what what is our audience interested in hearing about? We have a lot of great questions coming in. The first question we have is for President Napolitano and Chancellor Johnson. How will COVID nineteen state budget cuts and congressional aid packages? impact your ability to provide quality remote learning and student support next school year? So I'll, I'll start. Um, uh, look, uh, uh, we're going to have a, a, a state uh, budget cut, likely, unless uh, the Congress passes uh, another uh, CARES Act that has aid in it for the states. Uh, at which point uh, uh, we may actually see a small increase in, in our budget. Uh, uh, but one of the things that uh, we do uh, are investing in and need financial support for uh, is uh, the, the, the technology necessary uh, so that all students have the right equipment yeah. so that we uh, can provide hotspots for students who live in uh, areas where they don't have access to uh, 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 Wi-Fi uh, um, uh, and to uh, just, uh, you know, improve uh, and, and keep improving the platforms that we're using for delivery of our academic content. Yeah. So I think it's, it's similar um, at the State University of New York. We estimate that the COVID-19 crisis will be about a billion dollars cost to the to the state and you know the budget cuts will depend on whether we are able to uh, receive any resources from the federal government in the next cares act which would be important so and that splits along um, you know enrollment potential uh, cuts to residential halls and loss of uh, room and board and as well as then state cuts so I think that we're hopeful that we will receive some of those resources. Uh, we started about a year ago investing in the infrastructure that would allow us to put in place an online platform across SUNY, which was helpful. Um, the resources to do that investment, it's expensive as President Napolitano alluded to, uh, would be necessary. Rural access, access to broadband uh, and the internet in some of our rural communities, particularly upstate, would be very important as well. So. I think it's very similar uh, challenges that we face as well. Our next question is, what long-term effects do you think the pandemic will have on non-COVID related research? You know, I, I would say that it, it, um, it, it depends. I'm very heartened by the the news that President Napolitano just shared, um, it doesn't have to be that it, that it affects. I mean, typically when there's been recessions, you have experienced reductions in, in budgets. But on the other hand, we do know that, um, that after crises like this, and the most dramatic example was what happened after World War II, which really launched the, the original science, the endless frontier, the, the Bush, the Barnabas Bush report that led to the NIH and the NSF, and a realization of the centrality of uh, science to actually be able to lead the country and the world out of crisis. So th this is a time when societies need to uh, um, realize 
the importance of investment investing in science. So it's it it it, it doesn't necessarily have to do that. I think some. I, I hope it it accelerates that the transition from siloed research to the sort of convergent research that Chancellor Johnson was talking about, interdisciplinary inquiry that brings the natural sciences, the social sciences, the arts, and the humanities to understand complex problems of humanity. And the the pandemic is one such problem. The ensuing economic crisis is is another one. This is the social disruption that we're seeing. All of those require that convergence of different disciplines, and this is the time to, to enhance those investments. Does anyone else want to answer that or add it? Beautiful. Well, I think I think Julio said it very well, and uh, um, you know, uh, we did uh, you know uh, shut down some of our research labs. Uh, um, uh, 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 during the pandemic, we now need to ramp that research back up, get those grad students and postdocs back working in those labs, uh, um, and and at the same time con uh, continue the pace of the of all of the research involved with uh, uh, with um, the the virus with the pandemic. And uh, we we can multitask. We can do both. Uh, we need some help to, uh, financially to help get us yeah. there. Great. Our next question is, do students want to be on campus and out of the home? <laughs> <laughs> um, if we must revert to a virtual learning model, is there pressure to reimburse or lower tuition, further stressing higher education's economic model? That's a lot, but it's good. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think students are really want to come back, and not just students, faculty. We we all want to be there back. It's a you know universities do tend to build this sense of community. Um, we have observed uh, we have not observed a decline in deposits or in interest. Actually, quite the opposite. But the key here is to assure that we can reopen in a in a way that guarantees the safety and health of students and also faculty and. And, uh, and, and staff. And so I'm sure that both the University of California and the State University of New York have, have done the same thing. I mean, very, very detailed plans. Universities mm. are, have developed incredibly detailed plans to make sure that that, that, that happens. Right. Ours has four pillars. One is the, you know, what everyone is saying, testing, tracing, and tracking, the triple T. Testing is very, very critical here. Number two is uh, cleaning and disinfecting, you know, hand hygiene, disinfection. Three, the most important, I think, is protecting personal space, which means wearing face covers and re-engineering every single space, residential facilities, dining facilities, classrooms, to assure safe distance. And the fourth is vaccinating, not against the coronavirus, because I don't think we will have a vaccine quite yet, although I am very confident we'll have one, but not in the fall. <clears throat> but against the influenza, this is the first time those sure. two viruses are going to coexist. And the one vaccine we have, which is against seasonal influenza, we should have everyone uh, take, have their flu shots. So I think if we do those things and then innovate education, we use this opportunity to innovate along the lines of what President Napolitano was saying, blending, uh, I think we should be able to provide not just a, a you know, a, a, an experience that's similar to what was before, actually something better and make of the pandemic an incredible learning experience for this generation of students. You know, I think that very well said again. Um, one of the things that we've done is go back through the departments and look at every class and examine and assess the learning outcomes and find out, you know, there are just some things that need to be taught in a clinical setting, in a laboratory setting still can be done socially distant, as President Frank said, with proper personal protective equipment. And then we've learned what could be taught uh, online. And I, I'm sure, obviously, the, the President of Palatano and Frank have recognized this too, is that, you know, the concept of the flipped classroom. So I think you'll see all throughout higher ed changing, where you might have the master lecturer 
And you might have very large classes that even go throughout the system in some particular area, but then smaller, socially distant discussion, more detailed um, uh, work going on on campus. So I think that that may survive beyond COVID-19. Yeah, and I think one of the things that uh, has become clear is uh, that um, uh, there, there is more to the college experience than, than being online. There's a, there is a value in being on campus uh, uh, to uh, be forming new friendships, to be involved in extracurricular activities, to have kind of those spontaneous discussions with your professor um, that you really uh, can't can't uh, uh, match uh, online, and so um, uh, it's that that value that we have to continue to yep. build on uh, um, as we come back from the pandemic, come back safely with all of the measures that uh, President Frank and President Johnson have talked about, uh, um, but uh, recognize the value in that residential experience. Students want to come back. Their parents want their students to come back. So um, that's something that uh, we should we should keep in mind. Can I follow up on what President Napolitano said, if you don't mm -hmm. mind? I thought that was very well said. So here's an unexpected, you know, aha moment maybe. And uh, so looking at some of the feedback from professors and, and the students through uh, pivoting 400,000 students to remote instruction. Very interesting. What we're finding is that when you're teaching remotely, the empathy of the faculty member, the instructor, really impacts the learning outcomes. Now you may say, well, but even more so empathy and, and caring. You have to be more empathetic and more caring. I think that's gonna carry back into the in-person classroom. And it was really brought home when we, we uh, went out and surveyed a lot of our students. And one student wrote this marvelous, really terrific uh, letter to the SUNY faculty. But the classic line, which I'll never forget, was the particular student said, you know, if you're gentle with your questions, we'll be kind with our answers. <laughs> that was marvelous. <laughs> so oh, great. So great. Um, this one is our last question. Uh, how will the halting of technological immigration visas impact the educational mm -hmm. process and landscape? Yeah. Can you repeat that? I'm not sure I heard it. How will the halting of technological immigration visas impact the educational process and landscape? Well, I'll start on that one. Uh, um, uh, look, I, I, I think it, uh, uh, it's certainly not helpful. Uh, and, uh, you know, the United States for decades has been a talent magnet for the world. And mm -hmm. our systems of higher education uh, uh, have been uh, talent magnets. And the United States has benefited from that in Absolutely. innumerable ways. Yeah. Uh, 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 cutting, cutting off uh, that um, kind of international aspect uh, and the ability to have students from uh, around the world um, yeah. uh, it, uh, doesn't doesn't help the United States. Uh, uh, I mean, they may say it does, but when you really think about it, 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 it doesn't. So uh, uh, we're, we're quite concerned with some of the uh, uh, recent orders that um, the, the administration has issued. Yeah, I, I think it's a misguided policy. I mean, it, it's not exactly what you're saying, but people very often don't realize that higher education is also a main export. You can actually export services when, 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 the, when the consumer of the service, in this case, the student moves to the, to the place. So every time we bring international students, that's a form exactly. of export. And it's one of the exports it's, it's one of the largest service exports uh, in the United States, and it's one that has the most favorable balance of trade, because there's you know there's about a million uh, uh, students from other countries studying in the United States. The economic benefit is huge, both directly by the fact that they 
pay typically tuition and help subsidize the tuition for American uh, students. But also all the economic activity that they generate, I mean, it's been estimated to be in the order of $38 billion a year. And, and, and then it creates all these goodwill ambassadors. And then many of them, the best of them actually stay here and become that, uh, fuel, fuel that magnet for talent. So, so one thing we need to realize is the crucial economic value of universities, both to the local communities, by of course recruiting and, and, and bringing all kinds of students, but in particular international students actually represent in not just a source of diversity of greater learning, it enriches the experience of American students. It helps pay for some of the American students' education, but it's also um, it has, has all these other effects, all those graduates have lived in the United States, have known about the advantages and become the best advocates, the best ambassadors that the U.S. has all over the world. Many of our graduates end up in positions of, of leadership. They become prime ministers, presidents, um, CEOs around the world. This is one of the ways the United States has is able to influence for, uh, for the good uh, the rest of the world. So I hope we also see universities in that light. Great. Yep. Any final um, thoughts, Dan? Uh, Crystal, thank you for organizing uh, this Harris Lecture. And uh, thank you to Chancellor Johnson, President Frank, and President Napolitano. You, the three of you, have chosen to shoulder absolutely stunning, extraordinary responsibilities. And you do it in a spirit uh, of passion and service uh, for others and for humanity. And we thank you for all you do to make your communities, our country, and the world a better place. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Indeed, it was an honor hosting you. And, and as we adjourn, I just want to thank you all. Uh, thank our attendees for, for tuning in today. Um, all of our community events this summer are free and open to the public. And um, so we ask that anyone who's in a position to donate, uh, there's a link on our chat to donate to our program. Um, I hope that you all will join us for the rest of our summer series. We have our McCloskey Speaker Series event coming up on July 8th, featuring Ross Douthat of the New York Times, whose new book is out um, now entitled The Decadent Society. Thanks to you all for joining us. See you next time. <laughs>